Let's start again. Thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Paul, who's a military historian of the ancient Mediterranean. He got his he received his PhD from Duke with a thesis on Hellenistic military institutions. He's an associate professor and designs and teaches leadership and ethics curriculum at the Air Command and Staff College Maxwell Air Force Base. He's published numerous articles and book chapters on Hellenistic military history, Ptolemaic history, and ancient historiography. Paul is a scholar who takes defined and well-researched positions and is not afraid to go against the grain, but he does so in a really respectful and collegial manner. If I can just add a personal word, as recently as last week, Paul was very generous with his time and thoughts in responding to a paper I gave at a conference, and I appreciated that. And we appreciate his participation in our field of Seleucid studies. Thank you, Paul, for your presentation today, Problems in Generating Infantry for Seleucid Field Armies. Paul. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. And I am sitting outside, uh, so if the wind is bad and it's hard to hear me, I apologize. Um, but the heat dome is not here and it's pleasant out here and there are three small children inside. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, all right, so so essentially what I'm trying to do with this paper, and I'm, I'm going to try to not just read the whole thing because I don't want to bore you um, with, the, with me just reading all of it, uh, but essentially what I'm trying to do in this paper is uh, apply the modern military concept of force generation to try to rethink the way we arrive at Seleucid field armies. So... This comes from an observation that in a lot of our Hellenistic military history, especially related to the Seleucids, uh, we've started essentially from the field armies and the great campaigns. And it's great that we have detailed breakdowns of multiple Seleucid armies. And so we can talk about continuity and change and specific contingents with that army in ways that you know, for the Ptolemaic army, we get one uh, decent breakdown of, of the force, and we get multiple ones with the Seleucids. And so it makes sense to start there. Uh, but starting from those field armies has generally led to, uh, to theories of Seleucid force generation, how you put troops into a field army that have basically tried to work from the product backwards. Uh, and so essentially what I wanted to try to do was, uh, to some degree, work from the bottom up, or at least from kind of the middle, uh, which is something that I'm used to doing with the uh, Ptolemaic material, where we have all of this documentary evidence. And, you know, if we looked back a generation ago, the theory on the Ptolemaic army was essentially the same as what you'd get from uh, Bar Kokhba's seminal work on the Seleucid army, that it is a military settler based force, uh, individual obligations for military service tied to possession of a land allotment, uh, fairly successful uh, extractive efficiency, you know, uh, one allotment leads to one soldier in the army. So your military population at home is very similar to your military population in a maximum mobilization scenario, which then allows you to calculate the total number of Greco-Macedonians in the Seleucid Empire or in the Ptolemaic Empire. For the Ptolemies, decades of research has shown that that really doesn't work as cleanly as we once thought. Uh, there are uh, complex layers of institutions that change over time. There are all sorts of problems. Maybe these are just Ptolemaic problems, but this is what I want to explore uh, in, in making those institutions actually efficient. And so uh, their ability to extract the manpower on the ground and put it into the field army is, is not anywhere near the, you know, 90% efficiency rates that we see in calculations of Greco-Macedonian military settler population and the size of the Greco-Macedonian mobilization in Seleucid or Ptolemaic field armies. And so what do we do with evidence for this 
diminished efficiency in extracting military manpower to put it into field armies. Uh, and so that's that's part of what led me into this study. Uh, so I wanted to look, you know, we don't have the same sort of documentary evidence from the Seleucid side, but we, we do have at least some kind of lower to middle uh, information that we can use to then work back up. And I'm just focusing on the infantry because the cavalry is a whole additional set of problems. Uh, the, the scheme I'm using for thinking about this is the modern military uh, 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 scheme of force generation, which uh, involves um, seven elements. Um, I mean, there's a lot more to it, but it basically breaks down into forces, requirements, resources, demands, readiness, risk, and time. So, uh, and I'll, I'll go through those really quickly. Forces are your personnel and the institutions or structures they reside in. Requirements are the sorts of roles you anticipate them to need to perform. So if we were thinking about uh, the, the phalanx, the Seleucid phalanx, they're expected to perform phalanx battle, but what other roles are they also expected to perform? Are they sometimes asked to engage in uh, siege or assaults, uh, you know, even uh, fight in naval engagements or things like that. So, so what are the, the range of, of uh, requirements, resources, the amount of capital available to meet all of the other six elements? Demands are the missions that are anticipated. And so uh, if the mission is mainly to fight in the Royal Field Army and fight decisive battle, great. Uh, but I think most of us uh, would agree that uh, part of what the military population is doing on the ground is is a, a range of missions beyond uh, service in the Royal Field Army. Uh, it includes things like, you know, you know, mobilizing manpower to protect agricultural works during critical times of the harvest season, suppressing rebels and bandits, um, uh, even some, you know, more uh, performative ideological tied roles, which we to some degree see in the Daphne uh, procession. I don't want to start a debate about what Daphne is or <laughs> what's going on there. We, we had a good one of those before. Um, but there are a lot of potential missions. Uh, then there's readiness, uh, which is the idea that you want troops that are properly organized, properly trained, properly equipped, and properly led. Uh, so it's, you know, uh, it's great if you have a standing army, which is one of the, you know, when we think about theories of what the Seleucid army is, one of the theories is a standing paid army. So they are presumably already organized, trained, equipped, and, and hopefully uh, led. But if you want to have a properly organized, trained, equipped, and led standing army, you're using up an immense amount of resources. Uh, and uh, one of the problems that I think we look at is the Seleucid state is wealthy, uh, but maintaining a, a standing army in the, the realm of 60,000 or more men uh, continually in peacetime uh, is, is very expensive. Uh, and then there's risk. Uh, whatever your force generation scheme is, what are its potential vulnerabilities to contingencies? Uh, one of the arguments that I think is interesting um, that that we see from a range of sources is essentially that uh, the defeat at Magnesia, for example, is so devastating to the military population, the military settler population, so many of them die at that battle, that essentially Antiochus the Great has no real decision-making process to engage in. The decision has basically been made for him by the uh, vulnerability of his military population of suffering severe casualties. Uh, and, but if, but if there's a more robust population, uh, then 
he has to make a decision. And I think to some degree, a lot of the scholarship on Magnesia has removed the decision-making calculus from Antiochus III. Uh, and I, I kind of think there may be a little bit more decision-making calculus left for him after the disaster at Magnesia than we sometimes recognize. And then finally, time. Uh, how much time is, it, it takes to generate forces and put them into the field in the manner that you want to see them fielded. Uh, so I'll come back to some of those criteria uh, later on, or we can return to them, to them later. Uh, I'd like to have had a, a set of slides, but like I said, I, I spent all day yesterday in an airport um, and didn't get a chance to put some, some slides together. Uh, but if anybody wants that list of, of elements, I can share it again later in the discussion. Uh, all right, so within the theories of how Seleucid force generation worked, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say this is dominated by starting from the field armies that we get at Raffia, Magnesia, the procession at Daphne, and then to some degree from some uh, other engagements, we get some sense of the maybe not the size, but at least the names of the contingents in the army at Panion, uh, some again at Beth Zechariah, uh, but, the, but you know, so we've got three and then maybe two lesser examples to provide most of our material, uh, a handful of others. Uh, what to do with that has generally been led by the, you know, what I'd call the Bar Kokhva orbit, which is a military settler heavy explanation the possession of land leads to an individual obligation for military service. Then you have the Sherwin White Apergis uh, explanation, which is a little bit more of a standing army and a much larger conscription pool. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, 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 Hull, um, uh, and I, I, I think uh, Nick's, some of Nick's work points a little bit more at communal or associational obligations to military service, so not the direct individual obligation or liability from possessing an allotment, but the possession of allotments is tied to a community's identity as Greco-Macedonians, for example, uh, and the military obligation is nested within that community rather than within the individual and the community meets its obligations uh, that that are that are directed or negotiated with the state uh, and so that's a, a little bit more of an um, I'd, I'd call it a little bit more of an emerging camp i'd say the dominant view has been the bar Kokhba view uh, with the military settler population which itself produces a number of problems because you have calculations of the Greco-Macedonian population based off of the field armies of somewhere around, I think Bar Kokhba uh, will put it uh, uh, 45 to 60,000 um, Greco-Macedonian uh, military settlers in the uh, Seleucid Empire at its full extent. Um, and this is compared with fairly generous estimates of Macedonian immigration and settlement in the uh, period of Alexander and the early successors, where we're going to be talking about, you know, 15,000 uh, to 25,000 uh, immigrants, and that including uh, Egypt and some other areas outside of Seleucid uh, control. And so how to manage population growth, how much of it comes from Greeks, how much of it comes from other places, uh, and is that even enough population are some of the, the questions to look at. So what I try to do in the paper is take an inductive approach. I look at uh, Polybian uh, narratives of some of the smaller campaigns, especially the campaign against Molon. Uh, I look at Asia Minor and especially Magnesia. Uh, I look at the Syrian uh, uh, Seleucus uh, the evidence from Babylonia, uh, and then finally uh, auxiliaries and allies in the Magnesia campaign. Uh, and so I'll give us a little bit of an overview of those elements 
now uh, and then uh, kind of wrap up with some hypotheses points for uh, for debate. Um, so uh, first off, uh, in the campaign uh, against uh, Molon, uh, we uh, see first an, an interesting contingent in the Seleucid army that fights Molon. Uh, there is a contingent called a, a, a Xenicon, so foreign mercenaries, and next to it, a contingent called the uh, Mistaforicon, uh, paid soldiers. And now this is something that I think can be easily construed as a single contingent. These are paid foreign soldiers. Uh, and we see that combination of Zenoi Mistoforoi in the classical period on several occasions. But in Polybius's narratives, especially from the context of the uh, Fourth Syrian War, uh, here and in the Ptolemaic army at Raphia, there are contingents that combine foreign Zinoi and Mistoforoi, paid soldiers from the Seleucid or Ptolemaic army. Uh, and the grammar in both cases separates the two contingents. And I suggest that the two contingents are, are arrayed together in a similar spot on the battle line because they have complementary weapon sets. And the Ptolemaic evidence is very clear that there are, so this, in the Seleucid case, these are Zenoi and Mistoforoi uh, uh, infantry. In the Ptolemaic case, they are Zenoi and Mistoforoi cavalry. The Mistoforoi cavalry uh, are very well documented in uh, papyrological evidence as one of the premier cavalry units of the Ptolemaic army uh, with a, a more consistent standing or paid role than their uh, settler cavalry, uh, but slightly smaller in numbers, which is why they have to be brigaded with foreign mercenary cavalry to reach the 2000 that are at Raphia. Uh, at um, in the battle against Molon, you have these two contingents uh, arrayed next to one another, and immediately adjacent to them is the phalanx. Uh, so the Mistoforicon, the paid, the paid division in the Seleucid army, is not armed as phalangites, uh, and just based on comparative evidence that we know, I would, I would guess that they are probably equipped as Thuria Foroi or Therakatai, which is the two contingents uh, that we see operating in the Elbers uh, a, a, about a decade later. Uh, and that would fit with uh, trends in armament for medium, medium heavy infantry uh, in this period. Uh, in fact, on Molon's side, uh, his phalanx uh, comprise it, or his, his main battle line, uh, comprises Thuria Foroi, uh, Galatians, and other heavies. Uh, and uh, a, a number of scholars have wanted to assign a pike phalanx uh, in Molon's army, in part because we know that there were military settlers in Media and Persia, places and, and places where he could have extracted troops. But the absence in Polybius's narrative of describing, while giving fairly specific equipment-based descriptions of, uh, of forces in Molon's army, the absence of any reference to phalangitai, uh, I think is, is, is meaningful and suggests that these military settlers, when they come from their colonies, uh, are equipped in a local in a panoply for local flexible duty. Uh, so probably as Thuriofroi, Therakatai, even classical Peltas or Hoplites potentially, uh, or uh, perhaps a, a, a hybrid. Um, but I imagine the Sarissas and the uh, at least the 
uh, royal metal plated peltai for the phalanx are probably kept in royal armories. Uh, and so I suspect that what's happening is Molon has military settlers who could normally serve in the phalanx. Uh, but the absence of phalangites in his battle line suggests that those troops are equipped in a different panoply coming directly from the military colonies. Uh, and then would normally be re-equipped, perhaps at Apamea, uh, for service in the phalanx properly. Um, we see, I think, perhaps another piece of evidence for this in the Seleucid side at the same battle, uh, where on either side of the main battle line, Polybius describes epitagmata of both horse and foot uh, held in reserve. Uh, and these epitagmata, uh, I'd translate these as, as essentially brigades. They've gathered contingents uh, from various places that may be improperly equipped yet to serve in the phalanx as proper. Uh, and so they are posted in reserve. And this is at a time when uh, the, the Seleucid army is, uh, is unable to draw from Asia Minor and obviously not from the areas under uh, Molon's control, and so it's really just uh, Syria and northern Mesopotamia that are uh, generating forces for this army, and so they're able to generate a phalanx, they're able to generate uh, the uh, Mistophoricon, uh, and then they're able to generate these epitagmata. Now, there's little other, you know, these could be uh, local allies and auxiliaries um, and they may also be troops from uh, some of the, the colonies because this is a, a heavily colonized part of the uh, Seleucid space, uh, but some of them may not be properly equipped for service in the phalanx at this point in time because the uh, mobilization has been so extensive uh, for this campaign, especially after the, the previous defeat. Uh, we see the Mistophoricon again in the operations uh in Hyrcania and so I suspect that this is a, a fairly consistent part of uh the Seleucid of the Seleucid army um, when we move to uh Asia Minor uh and uh Magnesia the the and in here I'm talking about the Smyrna and Magnesia dossier we see at Magnesia uh, a similar sort of mixed foot and horse brigade. There are four distinct units uh, at the city of Magnesia. Uh, there are the uh, horse and foot Katoikoi, and there are the horse and foot Ipithroi, uh, the, the, the men in open camp. Uh, that at least suggests if, if we have a, a Hippithron uh, outside of Magnesia that suggests that these are standing uh, soldiers similar to the troops that would be in the midst the Foracon. Uh, but it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's unclear exactly where the Magnesian foot Katoikoi belong uh, in the Seleucid army. Now there's, uh, because we don't know if they are represented as, as having Macedonian status or if Macedonian status was required to be a part of the phalanx. Uh, but if they are foot and not part of the phalanx, then we have to ask questions about what Seleucid Katoikoi are and how many of them uh, were directed toward the phalanx when they were generated toward, uh, toward the field army. Uh, now, there are all sorts of reasons why uh, the troops at Magnesia might not be with the uh, Seleucid field army at the time of their uh, disagreement with Smyrna and uh, Alte and some of his work uh, on uh, Laodice's war and the Third Syrian War is helpful for understanding why or why not these troops are present uh, at home and not part of a, a fielded army. Uh, but what is also interesting is then when we get the contingent at the fortress of Pali Magnesia, we see there a contingent that is explicitly described as from the phalanx. Uh, and so that puts us in an interesting position. 
these troops from the phalanx, if we follow the idea of military settlers who are mobilized and then demobilized, these are presumably troops from a place or from a city uh, who in a different version we could imagine being described as the contingent from the contingent of under Timon of Apameans, uh, if they were military settlers from one of the Apameas. Um, but instead they're described as being a contingent from the phalanx, uh, which to me suggests that if the phalanx is not a standing contingent, uh, uh, as uh, some have suggested, um, then at least when troops are generated from their local institutions into the imperial center to be equipped and organized as phalangites, they then become part of the phalanx. Uh, and it is interesting that the Seleucid materials, uh, even from the historians, are very consistent in describing the phalanx as the phalanx, uh, at least down to Magnesia, uh, which we, it's not called, you know, the, the Ptolemies don't do that. Uh, even the, uh, the Antigonids don't quite do that. Uh, and so it is, it is interesting to see with Timon's contingent that it is called the, a contingent from the phalanx. Uh, and so what I suspect is when, when troops move from their local institutions, perhaps as uh, you know, troops from a, a actively serving camp or as Katoikoi or from a number of other institutions are moved to the imperial center, uh, say at Apamea, but, but it could be somewhere else, and, and enrolled into a unit of the phalanx, they then take on that identity as a part of the phalanx rather than their identity as a military settler from, uh, from Lydia um, uh, or somewhere else. Uh, but that's, a, that's a, a, a hunch from what we, what we see there. If we look at some of the other evidence from Asia Minor, especially from uh, areas under uh, Adelid control, uh, we see some similar sorts of, of, of evidence. Um, there are Adelid Katoikoi uh, or Kato, Katoikia uh, that do not have an ethnic identification. And then there are the well known uh, uh, settlements affiliated with the uh, Mysians. Uh, and with the Macedonians. And there's an ongoing discussion about when to date these Macedonian settlements, whether they belong to the uh, second century BC, uh, or whether they may date uh, to uh, the early third century, or even the late fourth. Um, apart from that debate, uh, it is at least clear that we get evidence for uh, conscription obligations from the uh, uh, the treaty between uh, the Adelids and Apollonius Carax and the Mysians of Cornubudos, uh, where they are promised uh, that the normal conscription load imposed by the state uh, will be approximately one man in three, uh, or one year of service out of every three years, or uh, a third of the men every year, something, something along those lines that that proportion, which could be interpreted a number of ways and probably could be interpreted by the state a number of ways, that that proportion is the, the basic promise, except in emergencies when it's clear uh, in, in the uh, epigraphic text uh, that the Adelids believe they can get many more soldiers uh, in a time of crisis. Uh, which gives us a, a sense Now we don't know how exceptional that agreement is, but the idea of, of essentially negotiating or setting up an, an expected standard for what your uh, obligation is. It's not that you have a Kleros, uh, an allotment, and now you have a direct obligation anytime, anywhere, or once a year. It's an obligation, in this case, it's imposed on a, on a community that has allotments, 
but not everyone has allotments. I think this goes to support some of uh, Nick's argument. Um, uh, the community has allotments, but the community is expected to answer this obligation, uh, but has some ability to negotiate uh, or some expectation at least that of what this uh, expectation or obligation is and that it is uh, well less than 100%. It's a, approximately one third. Um, and uh, then finally, uh, I just want to point out that if we look at um, you know, the general observation from Magnesia is uh, we've got four, four contingents in the town, uh, three additional uh, or four additional contingents uh, up in the fortress. So we've got a picture of considerable complexity at the local level, where that's the same number of contingents as you'd find practically in a whole Seleucid army. Uh, and so local complexity uh, or complicatedness is a, a feature there and is a feature again uh, in places like um, like Pergamon, where we have uh, the decree uh, of Attalus III that granted citizenship to a bunch of the military population that resided in Pergamon's territory. Uh, there were uh, stratioti, soldiers who were uh, presumably by that name in active service, uh, if not perhaps long serving mercenaries who were essentially permanently resident. Um, uh, settlements, again, of Macedonians and Mysians uh, who lived in inside or in the vicinity of the city. Uh, separately, uh, the explicitly Katoikoi, who lived in the citadel of the old city. Um, and uh, then an ethnic group called the Mazdieni, uh, and also uh, some semi-militarized uh, police units like the Perephilakitai. Uh, and some other troops. Uh, so that gives us a very complex picture of the institutions that were present at Pergamon uh, and used to generate uh, its own forces. Uh, and this picture uh, corresponds really well uh, with the evidence we get from Ptolemaic Egypt, where uh, there's quite an array of different institutions, units, ethnic affiliations, uh, and the state, when seeking to mobilize troops or generate troops, would draw sometimes from multiple local institutions with multiple terms of service to be able to put, uh, constitute a unit and put it in the field. Um, and so I suspect that, that something like this uh, probably would exist across uh, the Seleucid space. Although this, you know, it's it's a this is all a hunch. I'm just trying to um, pose explore the contours of this problem. Um, but anyway, at the local level, uh, I suspect that the military milieu is just as, if not even more, complex than the brigades of a royal army. And so then I suspect that it is in the act of marshaling the royal army, assuring that it is organized, trained, equipped, led in the right units for the right missions to generate the Royal Field Army, uh, though we actually see the process of staffing the core divisions of the Seleucid Army. Uh, that, that takes place at the center, which costs the state uh, time, uh, but saves this and, and probably and some readiness, uh, but gives the state uh, more flexibility uh, and allows it to uh, steward its resources uh, probably more effectively, uh, or at least more economically. Uh, so uh, what I see from that, at least evidence so far, is, is evidence for trying to, is, is, is less evidence for strict strategy or top-down authority over how to build the institutions at the local level, so a little bit more ad hoc or emergent uh, sorts of, uh, of developments at the local level, perhaps even uh, institutions that are derived primarily for their local missions, uh, like the Paraphylakotai or a Hippithron, 
Their, their main duty is not to the Royal Field Army, but to uh, local security, and then the ability of the state to extract from that uh, at less efficient rates than we've sometimes imagined and build and push out uh, the, uh, the famous units of the Seleucid Army, like its phalanx or the Silver Shields. Uh, but that brings us to uh, the Seleucus, uh, where uh, you've got the, you know, the, the quartet of cities in northwest Syria, Antioch, uh, Seleucia, Hieria, uh, Laodicea by the sea, and Apamea. Uh, all of these, uh, in a sense, uh, have, they've, they've got a significant population uh, and population. Uh, play a significant role in the Seleucid army. Uh, Antioch will be my focus in the discussion. Uh, Antioch is at least significant enough in generating manpower into the Seleucid army that in the seventh Syrian war, a Ptolemaic general, uh, or uh, sorry, the, the sixth Syrian war, a Ptolemaic general can refer to the Seleucid army as the Antiochians. Uh, or under Antiochus the seven, practically every household lost a man uh, in the great defeat against the Parthians. Uh, citizen soldiers of Antioch were prominent even into the late uh, Seleucid Wars, the civil wars as well. Uh, when Seleucus I founded Antioch, uh, he founded it with, 50, with something like uh, up to 5,300 settlers, uh, Macedonians and Athenians for the most part, uh, from Antigonea, uh, if we uh, trust the account from Malalas. Um, but by the Daphne procession in 166 BC, uh, there are 800 Ephebes marching and using kind of a uh, life tables just for a heuristic purpose that suggests that the military uh, citizen population military age male citizen population had grown to uh, closer to 9,000. So that's uh, some significant growth over time uh, and gives us a figure pretty close to uh, the Emperor Julian's comment hundreds of years later that there were 10,000 Claroi uh, at the city of Antioch. Uh, the original city uh, was fairly small, estimated at about 90 hectares, uh, but a second quarter was added for a multitude of additional uh, inhabitants uh, who we would suspect may not have necessarily had full Antiochian citizenship uh, from the start. We can uh, draw parallels between this and many other significant Hellenistic cities that have large non-citizen populations. Uh, then the third quarter of this city was built in the third century, uh, maybe into the early second century, uh, and uh, had a Greek heavy population uh, brought in to settle there, described uh, by Libanius as Aetolians, Cretans, and Yeboians. Um, and then finally, Antiochus IV built the last quarter of the city named for himself. Uh, which I suspect incorporated many of the local inhabitants of uh, the, the little neighborhoods called Iopolis, Badia, Cassiotis, and Amathia. And what is interesting there and what we get from Libanius is the development of, uh, of traditions to describe their descent from Greeks of great antiquity, uh, which would be a necessary component and their successful Hellenization and introduction to the ranks of the citizen body, which gives us between the third quarter and the fourth quarter, uh, plausible sources uh, for an expansion of the uh, citizen male population up to and then probably uh, beyond the 10,000 mark. Uh, the addition of non-Macedonians uh, to Antioch citizenry helps explain the expansion of a citizen population, but also because citizenship in the royal cities held a status comparable to being Macedonian itself, this also would allow 
uh, the Seleucids to recruit Greeks and Hellenized Syrians who were citizens of Antioch into, I think, any of their core contingents, including the so-called phalanx of Macedonians. Um, and, uh, but then the question is, what is the relationship between citizenship status at Antioch and the military obligation? Uh, it has been assumed by many scholars that citizenship and military service went hand in hand, that if you are a citizen of Antioch, that means you're obligated to military service. Uh, and if each citizen, Kleros, was expected uh, uh, to give uh, military service, then we'd also expect that the Kleroi were sized uh, for different types of contingents, larger Kleroi for cavalry, smaller for infantry, and then possibly even larger ones for members of the officer class. We see parallels to this in some of our Ptolemaic evidence. Antiochian military service of some kind is inarguable. There's extensive evidence for it. Uh, but obligatory service, I think, is unlikely. Uh, and the association between citizenship and military obligation was probably more general than specific. Um, I have a few reasons for thinking this. Uh, first, uh, we find citizens of Antioch and other cities of the Seleucid Tetrapolis in mercenary or active service outside the core contingents of the army. Um, I'd look at, uh, for example, uh, the Seleucid uh, roster from perhaps a Hapithron at Trallis in the Meander Valley. We know there's an Adelid Hapithron there. Uh, and this dedication, which seems to be from a cavalry unit, uh, lists uh, quite a few, both Macedonians, uh, Seleucians, um, and Antiochians. Uh, and then also in awards, uh, either honors, associations, or, or grants of citizenship from number, numerous cities in Asia Minor, uh, we see uh, a good handful of Apameans, Laodiceans, Seleucians, Antiochians at places like uh, Smyrna uh, and Miletus. Um, and again, that comports with the Adelid and Ptolemaic evidence, where, for example, inhabitants of Pergamon, uh, Alexandria, and Ptolemais appear in mercenary and standing contingents from all across the Greek world, even in service to their state. It's not just that you have to leave your state to go do that sort of service, but we find uh, this service distributed. So um, a, a, uh, a demotic from uh, Ptolemais in the Thebaid appears on the list of mercenaries or standing soldiers uh, from uh, just north of Laodicea uh, in the third century BC, for example. Uh, so I don't think this is abnormal, but it points to uh, a little bit more flexibility in figuring out what sort of military service might be attractive for your citizen population. The other reason I think this is if we look at Daphne, uh, part of the procession involves uh, 4,000 cavalry who are not from uh, the Seleucid Army's core cavalry contingents. There's the 1,000 Philoi, the king's friends, and 3,000 politicoi, citizens, um, who I'd guess might just be from Antioch, but maybe uh, from several of the other uh, cities. Um, the point is, these are, these are well-equipped cavalry uh, men, uh, but it's difficult to find spaces for them in Seleucid field armies. Uh, and I suspect that part of what's happening there is a similar story we see in Ptolemaic Egypt, where the desire to bring in uh, families, uh, settlers, uh, leads to grants of status as cavalry that are actually beyond your need or preferences for what you'd put into your field army. Uh, and so um, uh, the, the result, I think, at Antioch, and perhaps across the Seleucus, is a surplus of higher status Greco-Macedonians, too many for their Hatairoi, uh, but less valuable in cavalry traditions than the Medians. Um, so uh, Antiochus may have permitted the Politicoi, for example, to parade on horseback 
and then conscripted them into lower status infantry units for campaign. That seems unlikely to me. Uh, perhaps their sons were already serving uh, in the Silver Shields or the Hittiroi or the Phalanx, and they were thus freed from obligation personally. Um, and uh, finally, we could imagine that the Politicoi were in fact a military formation, uh, but Antiochus uh, and other Seleucids generally didn't use them in the campaigns that we have good descriptions of the field army for. Uh, what we can say is that the Politicoi aren't some new population in the empire or a population that had not been militarized previously. Instead, when gathering field armies for major campaigns, other contingents were usually more desirable before the army hit the maximum size that it could be sustained and coordinated. Um, so if I'm right in thinking that there's a surplus of Antiochian citizens for uh, the Seleucid army, how does the city manage its military contributions? The 10,000 Cleroi give us one option, uh, but we also get another option from the first century CE uh, from an inscription that describes uh, uh, the application of uh, required labor based on citizenship uh, through the plintheia or blocks of the city. The plintheia keep registers of the men who live within them, uh, kind of like the secretaries of the units of the katoikoi at Magnesia. Um, and the plintheia are mostly named after uh, a prominent person, institution, or association. So we get Pharnakes, the ex gymnasiarch, uh, the temple of Dios Soter, uh, or the Uergesiasti, uh, as just a few of these examples. Uh, of the two dozen surviving names, many are probably fossil names from the Seleucid era. We see three Iranian names Baghdadis, Pharnakes, and Damasophernes. We see one Thracian name, Bithus, and then mostly uh, Greek names and patronyms, um, Thrasydemus, Tamagoras, and so on. Aside from the dynastic name of Seleucus, though, none of the names are typically Macedonian. Um, and I would suggest between that and a few of the uh, a few uh, people who appear on the list with locally significant names like Cassus and Kidnus, uh, we have evidence for Antioch's role in the Hellenizing project, uh, or even the Macedonizing project for a Greek population. Uh, the Plintheia and their registers also means, if we trust the idea that this existed in the Seleucid era, uh, that Antioch had at least two distinct uh, mechanisms that it could use to manage troop selection. Um, the prevailing assumption has been that obligations attached to Cleroy were instrumental in Seleucid recruitment. Um, but one of the things that others have also uh, suspected, uh, like Michael Taylor is, uh, and, uh, and like Nick Secunda, is that the Antigonid conscription diagramma may give us some evidence for other means of conscription. I think that the Plintheia and the Politicoi cavalry support this possibility, uh, at least in at the uh, uh, royal foundation level in the in the cities, especially of the Seleucus. Now, if that is the case, uh, then it means uh, that, uh, and this would fit with the idea of of a single soldier being taken from practically every every household in the campaign uh, of Antiochus the seventh. Uh, 130, 129 BCE, um, and uh, that would also suggest that if the Antigonid model or something like it was followed, that the reserve not selected for campaign would generally be at least uh, the same size as those taken. Uh, and so the Seleucids were actually made, you know, in that sense, uh, the Seleucids are maintaining some sort of uh, reserve. On the other hand, uh, if we look at the 6,000 Kyresti who mutinied in uh, the winter 221 to 220 BC, 6,000 from that region uh, of that satrapy of Syria 
uh, sure seems to me like the full uh, military age male population we'd expect to see from that region. So either uh, Seleucid conscription, or either I'm underestimating the population of that region, Seleucid conscription was more extractive than Antigonid uh, practices we see in the diagramma, or perhaps the mobilization was temporarily more extensive under the pressure of the rebellions in the West and the East at the same time. Uh, so then what does that mean for the Seleucids most elite infantry contingent, the 10,000 Peltast or Argaraspides, the silver shields? According to Polybius, they were selected, picked out from the whole kingdom, uh, but later he described them as the picked Syrians. Um, and I suspect that the whole kingdom mostly means the Seleucus and the Syrian satrapies west of the Euphrates, which provided most of the uh, Greco-Macedonian settled manpower. Uh, I suspect uh, that the conscription of the silver shields uh, probably was analogous to the conscription of the uh, Peltast and the Ajima from Antigonid practice, uh, that these were men in the prime of life. They can be used for uh, forced marches. They're described, I think, at one point as light infantry uh, in the Fourth Syrian War. They conduct uh, rapid marches uh, and city assaults. Uh, fight in close company with cavalry in Antiochus III's Eastern Campaign, and then the uh, men armed in the Roman fashion at Daphne, who I think are correct to view as, as part of the Silver Shield's uh, normal population, are described as being in the prime of life. And so I think we see that similar model of recruiting troops uh, who fit a certain uh, uh, capability profile, but I think also probably uh, from the right families, and that the Antigonid diagramma uh, recruited the, their Peltastai and the Ajima of the Macedonians, not from the same fa uh, families as the Phalanx. They were selected from families that were larger and wealthier, uh, which could give us two different answers, potentially. Maybe it means both. They needed to be both wealthier and bigger. Um, and the phalangites from families that were poorer and smaller. It makes me think a little bit of the description uh, by Polybius of Roman recruitment of taking the velites from uh, soldiers that were younger or poorer, younger and poorer, and some of the flexibility that may have existed at the local level in assigning conscripted troops, mobilized troops into suitable contingents. Uh, but I suspect, uh, contrary to some of the interpretation we get from Barkakva and others, that the silver shields are drawn from an entirely separate population uh, than the phalanx population, uh, which has important implications for demographic modeling, because that means that your cavalry and elite infantry populations, while they have essentially kind of set unit sizes, are also, because of their wealth, uh, and resources more likely to have larger families, uh, and that encourages the Seleucids to try to find ways to extract those populations for military services service more successfully. Uh, and we don't know how well they did that or adapted to do that over time. Uh, all right, that takes me to Babylonia. Uh, we know uh, that before Seleucus I set out uh, from Babylonia against Lysimachus possessions in Anatolia, he mustered troops, uh, Greeks and barbarians, uh, uh, which must mean Mesopotamians. Uh, the diaries and chronicles from Hellenistic Babylon offer insights into Seleucid military institutions and force generation that uh, don't appear anywhere else in the Seleucid space. Um, unfortunately, uh, probably the best evidence comes from the period during and even after the Parthian conquest. Uh, during the first Syrian war, however, we do know that the Strategos of Babylonia spent the better part of a month collecting all the royal troops in Babylonia from top to bottom, and then led them personally to join the king's field army. Uh, later texts indicate many of these royal troops that had to be gathered from top to bottom 
were posted to garrisons. Uh, and from their generally active role in later evidence, I would surmise that these were probably a mixture of foreign mercenaries or Seleucid standing troops, the aforementioned Mistoferoi. Uh, during the Third Syrian War, the chief guardian of the palace, the Rab Sakadi, uh, at Babylon secured and locked the city gates and shut in the royal troops uh, stationed at the city. The phrasing uh, in the tablet suggests, I think, some tension. Uh, perhaps the guardians fear that the royal troops were preparing to either flee the city uh, or surrender to the advancing Ptolemaic army. Other texts confirm that the chief guardian, who's posted in the palace, had his own contingent of troops. These palace troops and the royal troops of the garrison are two distinct units. In fact, they fought one another in uh, domestic strife uh, on uh, multiple occasions. Uh, first, uh, in the period of rest from 238 to 235 or so uh, BCE, uh, I would suspect that the troops assigned to the chief guardian at the palace are probably Katoikoi. We see the Seleucids use Katoikoi in citadels frequently. Uh, and so these may be military settlers. As for the royal troops of the garrison, I would guess that these are not military settlers, uh, but are probably uh, serving in a kind of a standing role as local garrisons. Uh, and we see this not just at Babylon, but at many cities across Mesopotamia. Uh, the, in the, the Third Syrian War context, the chronicler repeatedly contrasted the cowardly safety of the chief guardian and perhaps his uh, his personal contingent with the repeated massacre of the royal troops in street fighting against the Ptolemaic army. Later, we also see the governor, the, the Pahad or Epistates of Seleucia attempt to get into the city and eject the Ptolemaic army with the troops that were assigned to him. So we know he's got a contingent of troops, um, but they were defeated. In the early second century, Babylon received a polis, a community of Greek or Hellenizing citizens called politai, uh, who were overseen and the whole city was overseen uh, by an epistates or pahat. The, uh, the epistates held authority over the palace, kind of like the Rab Sakadi, and also had troops assigned to him, uh, who in Greek are called the acrophilakes. The acrophilakes there, I would assume, from several connections between them and the Politai are connected to the Politai, who are probably connected to uh, the military settlers from the early period. If we look at comparative evidence um, from Susa, we see that the um, Katoikoi uh, are connected with service in the Acrophilakia on the citadel. Uh, and so this connection between uh, the the palace troops, not a palace guard, but really more like Falakes, Furroy, um, uh, happens in citadels across the Hellenistic world, especially in the Seleucid space. This palace contingent was at odds with the city of Babylon again in 163 BC, when they, alongside the Palatai and under the command of the Epistates, uh, fought several street engagements against the uh, city militia. Uh, the description of this violence uh, includes no mention of the garrison of royal troops, uh, which leads me to suspect that they were absent from that episode. Uh, and this is at a time when there was a royal field army mobilized uh, and dispatched to the east uh, with Antiochus IV. Uh, well, he was dead by that time, but, but most likely that's where the royal troops of the Babylonian garrison were at the time. Uh, they were certainly back at the city later and are attested repeatedly for several decades. Uh, after the establishment of the polis, the palace guards seem to be related to the citizen body, while no evidence connects the royal troops of the garrison with the polity. Um, and then it also seems that Babylon has uh, so two, two regular units the palace unit attached to the governor uh, and then the royal troops of the garrison. 
but also to military reserves. The first tied to the military settlers and later politi, the second to the rest uh, of the Babylonian population, the local Babylonian militia. I would guess based on Ptolemaic comparative evidence that we're talking really about policing forces. Uh, and some of our evidence suggests that uh, some of the use of those forces was for uh, policing, for uh, uh, control of canals and irrigation infrastructure, protection of them uh, during critical uh, times. In addition, uh, uh, the thing that we see take place in this period is that the Babylonian uh, military apparatus uh, becomes clearer and more prominent. The royal troops of Babylonia across the satrapy uh, become uh, demonstrated capacity to operate independently. So at a level above your local garrison, but below the level of the field army. Uh, so we start to see references that described the Masartu, the combined garrison of the royal troops from all across Babylonia. So a, a, a large brigade drawn from all of these different garrisons and commanded by the senior military commander of Babylonia, the general over the four generals. Uh, and we see that this contingent or brigade was capable of significant military operations. Uh, they uh, uh, defeat the remnants of Demetrius the first army when it fled to Seleucia Tigris. Uh, in 138 BC, the combined royal troops of Babylonia uh, defeat a large enemy force. We don't have a lot of details on it, but we know it contained uh, essentially multiple regiments and captured their camp. Uh, in another instance, uh, the senior general over the royal troops of Babylonia sent an agent to Babylon uh, with orders to mobilize the royal troops there uh, to join his full force for a campaign against Messene and Elam. Uh, and in late Seleucid Mesopotamia, the senior general Ardaya uh, conducted a strict levy of troops from the Politi of Babylon and the Politi of Seleucia uh, to raise troops for his army uh, before confronting Kamnaskiris in a campaign that reached as far as Susa. And so we see some, some evidence for this idea of the senior general controlling the, the scattered garrisons and combining them but also having the capacity to levy the politi as a supplement or additional troops uh, to augment that army. Uh, and then finally, uh, we get a, a description of, of levying troops in Babylonia from uh, the time of Antiochus VII's Eastern, Eastern Expedition in April 130, uh, most likely uh, this mobilization of troops was actually conducted by the Parthians under Phraates II and not under Antiochus VII, although it's not completely clear uh, who's controlling Babylon at the time. Uh, three contingents were ordered uh, from the city of Babylon. The first contingent's name is missing, but in the larger context of Babylonian uh, operations from the text, I would assume this was the royal troops of the city garrison. The second contingent was the politi, uh, so similar to our Daya's mobilization, I would surmise. Um, and uh, the idea of the politi being a, a group that you can mobilize is, is also reflected in their uh, possession of the gymnasium uh, and uh, their training in multiple weapon sets uh, in the decree from uh, Parthian era Babylon uh, that gave awards for both um, hollow shield combat, so uh, which sounds like the Macedonian shield, uh, and uh, Thurios combat uh, to both Ephebes and Neoi. Uh, and I'd suspect that the, the Ephebes and the young men uh, probably provided most of the palace phylakes uh, to the epistates. Um, and then the last of the three contingents is unfortunately uh, too garbled to decode. Uh, it could be the phylakes from the palace, but it could also uh, potentially be a reference to uh, the city militia. Um, uh, and then if we look up at Seleucia Tigris, uh, we know that in 141 BC, they provided 
both new recruits and many soldiers from the Politai uh, to the army of the chief general of Babylonia in 141 BC. Uh, so uh, while the standing royal troops of Babylonia become more important in the late Seleucid and early Parthian era, it is clear that the Poles uh, and their Politai could and often did still generate forces for both regional and royal armies. Paul, could you could you maybe skip to your conclusions? I mean, this is all great. I don't, I don't mean to be rude. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. And uh, yes, I've run over time. Um, the uh, in terms of conclusions, uh, I suggest the common theory of maximal mobilization of a highly efficient system uh, for generating field armies will not do. Uh, in its place, uh, I'm offering some suggestions that I hope might be adapted, elaborated, and, and perhaps eventually adopted in future scholarship. Uh, so uh, first, uh, the Seleucid system was more complicated than usually recognized and correspondingly less efficient at generating forces into royal field armies. Um, the royal field army was, after all, only the most visible of many purposes the system served. This also means the military milieu must have been considerably larger than the manpower represented in even the largest field armies. Second, the military settlers were a more diverse institution and population than normally assumed. And I don't necessarily mean diverse in the ethnic sense, although that seems necessary to some degree. From Pergamon to Palai Magnesia to Susa, allotment possession corresponded most consistently not with duties in the field army, but with duties in citadels, fortresses, and policing. Settlers in the cities provided an important source of manpower, but were militarized more in the normal Greek tradition than representing an army settled in town that just needed to be activated. It seems likely that their allotments, when they had them, carried a general military obligation rather than a specific one. In sum, the variety in the system's military populations, the variability in their military obligations, and indicate indications of change over time should caution scholars against simple or neat solutions. Third, non-mercenary standing contingents were a significant factor across the Seleucid Empire, but whether any part of the phalanx held that status in peacetime remains, to my mind, unresolved. Uh, fourth, local military institutions seem likely to have been able to carry out their own military operations and then present forces to the royal army when needed. Our limited evidence suggests the possibility uh, that the royal center received heterogeneous contingents from local or regional sources and then converted them into the famed core contingents of the royal army as able and as needed and otherwise could form them into other types of brigades. Fifth, if the Seleucid force generation system was less efficient than commonly imagined, then logically its population base must have been correspondingly larger. If so, the Seleucids must have militarized more of the local population from its core regions for military service than has sometimes been recognized. There were probably several important shifts in Seleucid mobilization practices. The reign of Seleucus II, uh, a time of, of great crisis, and the era after the Treaty of Apamea seem like strong candidates for reform. So future evidence and analysis may clarify the eras and mechanisms the Seleucids used uh, to bring more populations into the military milieu. All right, thank you. So thank you very much, Paul. That was awesome. And I'm sure this uh, will receive a great discussion. And we have the pleasure that Phil de Souza is with us to, to help us with the discussion, starting with his expert feedback. Now, Dr. Philip de Souza gained his degrees in the school, uh, sorry, in uh, Royal Hollow, uh, Holloway College and in the University of London, and is now an associate professor in the School of Classics at the University College Dublin. He's most well known through the many, many publications, which are the envy of many colleagues, not just over a hundred important publications, around 20 of them books, 
but so many of uh, the books have been translated into so many languages, including German, French, Spanish, Ch and Chinese. So um, that is uh, really an indication of how well he is writing and uh, how, how far his reputation as a scholar goes. So the topics of these books cover wars. He is one of the exp uh, experts of ancient wars, um, such as the Persian War, the Peloponnesian War, um, and also more general accounts of war and peace in antiquity. Piracy and seafaring is another a particular topic for which he is much acclaimed. So Phil, I'm very grateful that you have taken on the task to provide us with feedback um, to, to uh, Paul's paper. The floor is yours. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Altai, for um, uh, such a wonderful introduction. I don't recognize myself, although I like the idea of never mind the quality, feel the expanse. Um, and Firstly, I should say thank you very much to Paul for a, a stimulating paper and one that, in my view, is to be commended, first of all, because of its sheer scope. This is a tough topic to take on. There is a great diversity of material. There is a great diversity of topics that you have to account for within the main topic. And there is a fantastically complicated bibliography and historiography to all of this that I'm very impressed with the, the way that Paul has dealt with that. Um, I would also say that I think this um, argument that um, everything has to be, or the key thing has to be the pragmatic approach, that's the key to understanding most military operations. It is always essentially about getting the job done. And Paul has emphasized the diversity of jobs that have got to be done. That's very important. Um, we shouldn't be too critical of previous scholars who have tended to focus on the field army, particular engagements and so on. Um, and in particular, I think with Barcockwa's book, it remains the go-to book for the Seleucid armies. But remember, this was a doctoral thesis um, written within a limited amount of time and with a relatively limited uh, range of materials that he could actually deal with. It's great that Paul is expanding the range and he's saying, look at all these other things. Look at the diversity and look at the complexity. And it's the limits of the, the possibilities that might have been available to the Seleucid monarchs and in their particular circumstances, which I think has been very well stressed. So generally, I like the way this is being done, and I find that the, the, the thrust of the whole paper is, to my mind, very persuasive. Um, if I look at a few specific issues, um, one thing I would, I, would em I would sort of join in emphasizing is that the composite nature of the different forces that the Seleucids are using is really important. It changes under circumstances, it changes according to location, and it changes dramatically over time. And I like the fact that you're encouraging us to think of Seleucid military operations in terms of different eras where there are necessarily different answers to the question, how do I get enough men to do this? Um, I'd like to do a plug for a book that was fairly recently published on the... Um, now, what is it actually called? It's on uh, the armies of Seleuc the Seleucid army of Antiochus the Great. Um, it's the publication of a South African uh, PhD by Jean Duplessis. And one of the things that he tried to do was to consider just how flexible and diverse different units of Seleucid armies could be. He made use of his own... Um, uh, paramilitary training and um, his own use, his own knowledge of um, combat skills to argue very diverse. And I think that is something that underlines one of the points you're making, which was that at any given moment, the Seleucids are trying to do an awful lot of different things with their military forces. Therefore, necessarily, they are recruiting them in 
diverse and to some extent ad, ad hoc ways. Um, one element of all of this, and I think maybe could be given more emphasis, although it is a tricky thing to do, is um, the light infantry or the non-heavy infantry or the auxiliaries and the irregular troops. Um, now, there are people who are um, listening in. Um, Aaron, uh, uh, Nick might have uh, something to say about this, but I think you have to bear in mind that there's a great need for these not just in the peripheral elements of major campaigns, uh, but also in the constant need to show there's a, a an active military force. And I'll maybe come back to that in a little while. And this leads also to the, the diversity element that you've emphasised, that the Seleucid armies are always composite armies. Um, that, again, I find very convincing. And... When I've looked at different eras of, of ancient um, history and different forms of warfare, I even once attempted to um, get together a whole load of people to um, produce chapters on a thing called The Ancient World at War, which was looking, trying to do a global look at ancient warfare. All armies seemed, in a sense, to be alliances, federations. You get some men from here, you get some men from there. What can you do to put together to defeat your enemies? And this, again, I think is something that you're bringing out well. Um, there is a kind of, um, not elephant in the room, but let's say something that you to some extent understated because you haven't got time to go into it, which is the real limitations of the evidence we have. Um, the indicative examples that you took are in some cases the only examples that you can take. And so that has to be built into any conclusions, which, which you clearly are doing, and acknowledged as the limits of what you can do with this material. Um, and while I was sort of preparing for this, I had a quick look at um, uh, Launay's introduction. He has about, I think about 20 pages almost um, on the, the nature of the evidence. And he concludes, Really, for some of these areas like the Seleucids, we haven't a clue. And that's important. So you have to accept that the answers have to be sometimes this particular example seems to suggest that something similar may have been happening more generally. I have no problem with that. Um, I think it's a case of we, what can we conclude on the basis of the evidence that we got, given how little we can really know. So... Um, You've, you've done well on that, and I, I'm very happy with that. Um, I liked your breakdown of force generation and the emphasis on certain elements. Again, the um, the need to get specific operations underway. And I wondered about logistical capacity as being something that is there in some of the sources. Um I like the way that you were making use of the Moloch revolt, because although we really haven't got a clue what they were, it seems clear that Polybius is well informed, or at least he thinks he is well informed. He goes into quite a lot of detail about tactical and strategic and even logistical elements. Um, and, and book five gives us the impression that there's a great deal of what you might call general staff discussions and meetings and uh, delegation of duties going on, which again fits with this diversity and complexity element. Um, using specific available documents to show diversity is great as well. Obviously, the Smyrna dossier is probably the best known, um, but I've yet to see anybody take it fully apart. <laughs> and say, what are all the elements here? And I really I really like the way you dealt with that. It illustrates more of this flexible, pragmatic necessity. And another element that came out of that to me, and also other parts of the paper, was that there's a lot of negotiation going on here. The king doesn't just command, I want all the soldiers of this capacity. The king and his friends, and his companions, and his senior generals, and his governors, and those who are representatives of his allies and those who are going to negotiate with them and senior people in various cities and so on, 
represent layers and groups that have to do an awful lot of work in order to put together whatever operational forces are needed for whatever operation. Um, and that I thought was very interesting, that little detail you picked about out about the governor having to spend a month pulling together the royal troops. That seems to me to be more illustrative of the hard reality of what's going on at any one point. Um, a little aside here is that you made several references to peacetime armies. Was there ever peacetime in the Seleucid Empire? <laughs> Was there ever a Seleucid monarch who could sit on his throne and say, we have peace? This is going on all the time. And I, don't be afraid to think in terms of the king's main function is directing or trying to direct all of these military resources because that's clearly how they thought of themselves. They would take their leisure occasionally. Uh, we know that occasionally it could be argued that uh, a, a kingdom is at peace because there are no major wars going on, but there was necessarily always the delegated responsibility in various elements or various areas to continue military operations. Um, and so I think the emphasis on what has to be done at local level what different groups of citizens, non-citizens, settlers, and so on, would be contributing to military service is a very good one. And again, it, it's an element of this pragmatically, how do you deal with the thick situations you've got to deal with and what local um, solutions could be found to these problems and how those solutions might change over time. Um, that's, that, I thought, is really, really good. Um, Something that struck me, and it's clearly struck um, you as well, is that this is not so different from what we see elsewhere. Um, the recruitment registers probably are similar to what the Antigonids have. The way in which you allocate your Clairoy and then you uh, negotiate with them to get what you need from them does seem to be reflected in the Ptolemaic system. And I would say a lot of what you're talking about as well is to considerable extent reflected in the Roman Republican system. There is not a standing army. There are those ad hoc armies and those allies and those additional allies that are recruited when and where you need them. And this, to me, gives a, a more general kind of sense that the Seleucids are not exceptional. They are, in a sense, um, typical of all the problems that have to be addressed. In that regard, I would say don't underestimate what you might call the downside of pragmatism when it's being um, directed by ambitious or desperate Seleucid monarchs. They would not be unhappy with stripping every single qualified settler or citizen out of a city so that they can field whatever army they can. It would be the, if you like, the unfortunate responsibility of the city's leading citizens to try and say, well, your majesty, we can't obviously supply you with quite that many. You want that much, we can give you this, and there's going to be some give and take. But yeah, I think at certain times, the Seleucids may have said, well, no, would not even have thought about the long-term population trends, or have we overdone our capacity here? Have we overstretched what we can provide? Just get me as many men as you can, and get them out there. And in a sense, another thing that you didn't emphasize, but which you certainly put in in the right places, was the extent to which all the free populations of the Seleucid Empire had some sort of military practice, training, and could be equipped. And that could create very diverse and flexible military forces. One of the areas you didn't go into, and obviously you simply didn't have the time to go into in any detail, were what I think you were going to recall the, the allies and auxiliaries, the ones who don't seem to fit into a, a, a Seleucid system. But they're always there. Um, and I thought, um, I think in practice, you can see quite a lot in Book 5 of Polybius of the use of different light-armed forces, and I would argue all the naval forces that the Seleucids deploy are mobile light-armed strike forces primarily that they're being used to raid, to plunder, to harry the supply lines, to keep the 
the war going to keep the conflict problematic for the enemy. And these do need to be factored in to the overall military capacity. And they make this picture even more complex and even messier, which seems to me, again, to be realistic. Um, so overall, I found your methodology and your central conclusions with the caveat of the limits of the evidence to be very persuasive. And this sense of a complex ad hoc, we've got to deal with the problem and we've got to find ways of making it possible to deal with recurring problems of this nature seem to me to be in a sense characteristic of a real Seleucid military structure. Thank you very much, Phil. That was uh, very clear, very constructive. Um, and uh, I'm sure that Paul would like to respond. Uh, thank you for all that. You gave me a, a, a lot to think about. I, uh, the, the naval side of the evidence and the, the, the light infantry side is certainly really adds additional dimensions uh, that would be a lot to, a lot to add. But uh, we do have those interesting texts from uh, the Levantine coast for the community at, I can't remember which uh, places where they talk about their contribution of forces for naval operations. And I, I, I think your description makes a lot of sense. And part of, part of what I'd get into with the auxiliaries would be, you know, thinking about this local capacity that is significantly larger, but limited in, in its expeditionary uh, ability uh, and um, and then the idea of extracting smaller contingents from the local level who serve both to augment your own forces uh, but I theorize perhaps also essentially as a type of hostage uh, to try to maintain the loyalty of other regions while you march somewhere else um, uh, the 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 evidence we have is very limited and and one thing that i think i i probably didn't address enough perhaps is is the logistics uh but i i do think and to some degree when we look at force size i think one of the basic problems in estimating the size of the seleucid military population by these largest fielded armies is those fielded armies were also at kind of the maximum size for any pre-modern fielded army uh, and so it surprised me if their actual military population was also exactly that size, when even if they had, uh, you know, a Roman sized conscription pool of three quarters of a million or more, I still don't think any of the royal field armies would 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 exceed except under maybe exceptional conditions about about 80,000 men, because beyond that point, you, it's impossible to uh, or in, incredibly expensive uh, to feed, pay, supply that sort of army, um, and uh, and so I think I think that makes a lot of sense. But I'll stop talking. I, I talked a lot, and uh, I've I was awake for 27 hours yesterday and got four hours of sleep. I apologize for rambling, um, but I hope we can have a little bit of discussion. And thank you again so much for your comments, Phil. Thank you. Fine. Uh, so. Um... All the questions you have raised, Phil, they will continue being part of the discussion uh, for sure. And I now ask everyone uh, in the audience to think of a question. I have the privilege now of moderating, so I can ask a first question that I have. After saying that, um, Paul, I find your overall approach uh, very productive and convincing. Uh, I may have some uh, question, minor questions or concerns here or there. Uh, but uh, the the bottom up approach um, is uh, convincing, and also what you say about the numbers, the maximum numbers, um, is uh, very compelling to me. Uh, now, I I like to pursue the following approach: if you are right, then some questions arise, um, and they may be of different nature. But the first question is. Was there only a single one phalanx in the Seleucid kingdom? Which you seem to be um, arguing, a single phalanx meaning when the king decided to go on a major campaign, 
He would then call together or, recruit, or have his phalanx recruited, armed at Apamea, and then move out into whatever direction. And that phalanx would then serve and either be uh, eliminated or, or retired later on. But was there, well, what, what was going on, say, in media or in, uh, in the upper satrapies or in Asia Minor when there was a major war or a major, com uh, a major combat that the king was not involved in? Was there regularly no Sarissa phalanx involved of whatever size? Your main argument seemed to be the case of uh, Molon for whom we do not have the explicit evidence. So uh, I would like to tap you a little bit on this or to, to provoke you a little bit uh, to think this further. Yeah, uh, so I don't know how provocative that would be, but to me, the, the phalanx and the way it's cast like that may not make it much past Daphne. I, I suspect that between uh, Daphne and, well, between Apamea, Daphne, and shortly thereafter, we see some probable reforms in the Seleucid army. We certainly see the left wing and the right wing a feature in a lot of uh, the Maccabees and uh, Josephus. And so that may, I think that's a legitimate reform. It's reflected in Ptolemaic evidence too. But yeah, I think, I think the phalanx uh, connects with the Macedonian identity of the Seleucid dynasty uh, and so if there are other uh, Sarissa armed contingents, I would guess that they at least weren't called the phalanx uh, and that the king liked to control that ideologically significant and militarily significant unit as something that he or his heirs, it, you could break it up into, you could have a, a brigade in different places, but they're all brigades of the phalanx uh, and it's normally associated with the royals and their control or with a, a general who they've empowered to lead um to lead the phalanx like the king doesn't have to be with it but i i think it's a core part of the royal army and exists in that royal dimension i could be wrong but but the way i read the sources i think i think that is what's going on and that at the local level they they are not fighting as uh sarissa armed phalangites or if they are, they're not calling it the phalanx. It's a local unit, but I suspect they're armed otherwise. Um, that's yeah. Uh, that may be very provocative. I appreciate you pushing back on me there, but that is what I suspect. Um, thank you. Since I do not yet see any other hand up, then I just uh, specify. You're too late. I, I'm seeing you now. <laughs> but no, um, the Apamea part in this uh, component. So um, that's also that uh, Nick Secundar uh, argues quite uh, precisely that, uh, well, soldiers going out on a major campaign all had to go to Apamea. And you also said that specifically for the phalanx, not for the other units because uh, or for the diverse other uh, equipments, which they may have had locally, but for the phalanx. Do you think that this was a deliberate um, step to also keep this uh, contingent under stricter royal control? Uh, or may that be overemphasized? Or is it also possible to think that uh, if the campaign was going to go to, say, Western Asia Minor, then much of the equipment would be shipped uh, to the soldiers rather than uh, so yeah would you specify yeah, I, so that? I, I wouldn't make a rule from it that would break the pragmatism rule okay uh, so right. I think normally under normal conventions you gather the troops at Apamea that seems to be a long-standing convention in the Seleucid army uh, and uh, you have royal armories, perhaps in multiple places, but uh, I would suspect at Apamea is where, I mean, that's where we're told a lot of the royal military equipment is held. Uh, but yeah, under under pragmatic conditions, you, you ship it, you try to manufacture new ones. Um, but, uh, uh, but yes, as a, as a general principle, uh, but not a law, I would say yes, Apamea. Okay, thank you. Uh, ben. Okay, uh, first of all, Paul, you were not rambling at all. You just have a lot to say. 
So, so you have nothing to apologize about. Anyway, I thought it was great. Um, I want to focus on conscription. Um, first of all, an ignorant question. Is there a systematic study of conscription in the Hellenistic world? I know of studies in the Roman world, but I guess that's to, a question to everybody. Because to me, it's really a fascinating subject, all right? Um, but I want to locate uh, that in the context of a discussion that Altai and our friend Richard Wenghofer are having about, about Seleucid ideology and resistance against the Seleucids. And I'm wondering if we have cases of, you know, I'm a child of the 60s, you know, hell no, we won't go, right? Um, of, of, you know, resistance to conscription. Um, and I guess I'm asking, is adherence to conscription just because there's coercion? In other words, if you resist, you will get killed. Or does it, is, it a, is it a hallmark of loyalty to the Seleucid kingdom? So, <laughs> uh, Nick, Nick I, I feel like, knows all the bibliography of everything. Um, he may know if there's a study on conscription. I don't know that there, I mean, there's discussions of conscription in the Antigonid diagramma. Uh, there, 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 but I don't know that there is really a systematic study of conscription. My famous, so I'll immediately flee to anecdotal evidence uh, and say that one of my favorite pieces on conscription evidence from the Ptolemaic world is at the time of mobilizations for the Fourth Syrian War, um, we have a text where a rich uh, uh, merchant from Sicyon has his sons given spots in the Ptolemaic police, which are overwhelmingly uh, native Egyptian, uh, but presumably as a way to try to get them out of conscription. Um, and that may be me reading a 60s sort of flee to Canada thing, but uh, it, it is striking to see this well-off man get his two military age sons into a otherwise heavily Egyptian police force at a time of major military mobilization and not be tempted to draw an inference. No, I mean, that, but that's, that's, a, that's an interesting example. That's the kind of thing I'm looking for. Well, a lot of it comes down to what you mean by conscription. Ooh. I mean, that's one way of putting it. Um, Lowney has a section on recruitment. And others sometimes talk about service. But you have to look at it in terms of uh, fundamental terms. Why would you want to be in a Seleucid army? Okay. There may be obligations that go with your status and your inherited position, but they will also have social and cultural pressures associated with them. Putting it another way, why would you not want to be in the army? That's what you're here for, boy. And then there are local obligations in cities. There are clearly leaders large um, the heads of certain families and so on who are expecting people to join in the city contingents there is also the fact that you're going to get paid in most cases you will probably have a reasonable chance of getting blunder and you will also have the opportunity to be a warrior a soldier to be a proper macedonian greek whatever you want to call yourself so I don't think conscription necessarily works, except in those circumstances where it tends to be emphasized in the sources, where there is a problem with recruitment. And then conscription is perhaps the better word. Does that, does that make sense? It make, Everything both of you are saying is making sense. But I'm thinking about what Richard talks about, about resistance to the Seleucids, that everybody, you know, that... So, so I mean, you, you're you're framing that very well. In other words, in that world, as it was, stop superimposing the '60s or our world, where you might want to flee to Canada or something like that. In that world, that would be a really great thing to do. Or if you're the second son and you're not going to inherit, you know, the, the house or the or the whatever, right? So I understand that, but I still think that this does. Call, I think it's an interesting subject. You know, in other words, I'd like to see something, you know, in Sparta and Rome and see, you know, the different things. 
and and that that um, conscription slash recruitment thing is a is an interesting thing. Well, what we know on the other end is uh, there's often uh, unrest related to demobilization. Uh, so looking on the back end, demobilization causing unrest, uh, but then conscription and how conscription is managed on the other end, it's a little bit it's a little bit tougher. I mean, demobilization, like what am I going to do now if you demobilize me? Yeah, uh, well, so there's the argument about the the unrest in Egypt after the demobilization of the army in the fourth Syrian war. And then there's the unrest in Antioch and other parts of Syria when the army's demobilized by, is it Demetrius II? Uh, attempts to demobilize his forces when he's briefly in control of the reunited empire for like three months. Um, attempts to demobilize his army and that leads them to revolt to Diodotus Trifon, who's going to start paying them again. Right. Okay. Good. Interesting. Thanks. That raises the question or, or returns the question of, is there ever any peacetime? Right. And is indeed peacetime something to be avoided? You've got this monster of a military, socio-economic, political structure. You'd better keep riding it. I, I would also endorse that um, I think in most times it was something attractive uh, to be drafted into the Seleucid army, especially as a phalangite or even um, other elite units. Um, and uh, well, comparing that, say, with uh, the Roman army, we hear about problems in really bad times, say in the course of the Hannibalic War, uh, when there had been so tremendous losses. That's when we hear about problems. We also hear about it uh, two generations later in the course of the Hispanic Wars, um, when, well, people, Romans, the Romans were gradually noticing, oh, the sons that we sent last year or 10 years ago, they are not coming back. And they are drafting ever more. And the few that do come back, what bring do they bring home? It's not worth it. Then we hear about problems and about potential conscription, or even uh, the Roman Senate deciding, okay, we are no longer conscribing uh, into um, our legions for the Hispanic War. If any governor wants to go, or if, if any nobleman wants to go, he sh shall find his own people, um, as uh, Scipio the Younger. Uh, then did and won the uh, Numantine War with all his private connections. So, um, but the normal thing is that uh, a kingdom as the Seleucids, normally their military operations, not just the large scale battles that we mostly talk about, but also the many other military operations that have been uh, hinted to at least by Paul and by Phil today, uh, they were successful status building, status confirming, and also a source of revenue. So um, I think, yeah, we, we need to assume a positive attitude under normal circumstances. I would have another question, again, pushing further, what would be the consequence? Now looking at the complexity at the local levels that you have pointed out, I agree that there is some evidence for a lot of complexity at some local in some local uh, instances. Pergamon, Magnesia, very good examples, but also the Babylonian case. Um, uh, and uh, I wonder, however, if you are also right first to generalize that every well everywhere locally there was a high level of complexity. So more than one unit, uh, so often more than two units. And if you are further right, or I may have misunderstood you, that basically the local levels generally send some recruits to the king and the king or his officials would then form um, the royal army out of it. That would raise the question about the ethnicity, not just of the Macedonians, the Phalangites, but that would seriously uh, raise the question also about the Galatians, the Thracians, the uh, the Mysians, uh, the the Cretans, um, and uh, and uh, whatnot. Um, 
do you think that we can generalize that most of these ethnic units say from the beginning of Antiochus the first on or even from later in the rule of Seleucus the first were named after their armor mostly and of course if there is a new recruitment if there is a new conquest or a new alliance then you bring in a few thousand of a certain ethnic but then gradually they would be uh, dispersed and then it's actually close to impossible to recruit all of them later on how would that work what would we then have uh well the, the the question is to to cut it short if we have so many small ethnically diverse contingents locally how is it then possible to have significant ethnically defined units in the royal army between one and five thousand very often um unless we imagine their ethnicity to be at least largely fictitious. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, based on uh, you know some level of dissent uh, and perhaps panoply, I imagine the answer is uh, yes, no, and maybe depending on the situation. Uh, so yeah, I. I I would guess that there are cases where it's it's almost entirely fictitious and cases where it's actually pretty pretty reliable uh mm -hmm. all variations in the middle okay well that makes sense to me and uh, now nick please um uh, in, in the athenian army uh, uh, the penalty for not turning up for when you're conscripted and i believe that uh you know, all healthy male citizens were, were subject to, to conscription weapons. The penalty for not turning up uh, for, for when you were mobilized was loss of citizen rights and confiscation of property. Um, you know, all, all this, uh, uh, I think it's very important to, to realize fully that uh, Athens was a completely slave dominated society all economic life in athens was done by the slave class and uh it's it to a, a greater or lesser degree it's true for all ancient societies i would hold and uh loss of citizen rights was a uh, was a big incentive to uh to uh you know to turn up uh, when you were conscripted um as you know i i believe that uh that the Macedonians uh, living within the uh, Seleucid Empire were, uh, by virtue of their status as, as Macedonians and subject to the Macedonian king of all Asia, were subject to uh, to conscription. Um, and that, I, I enjoyed your your you you your presentation. You know, faithfully. Re represented the complexity of the problems that uh, that uh, are before us in in the anal analysis of the of the um, information and uh, I, you know this uh, as you know I believe that uh, the uh, uh, there was a such some such as a, a, a thing as an ethnic Macedonian status in the empire and, and you were subject to uh, to uh, conscription if you were subject to the king. But the, the 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 whole I think the, there was a whole diversity of mechanisms for uh, for uh, for uh, enabling the uh, you know uh, the fulfilment of, uh, of of military obligation in the empire, not 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 one uh, uh, sort of mechanism. Yeah. If if I if I can stay you know hold the stage for. Uh, a, a few more. I think this is the um, um, it's uh, one thing that I've been uh, uh, grappling with uh, with 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 uh, there is evidence for for yeah some evidence for Macedonian uh, settlement in in media for example um, and uh, it's questionable you know further east but um, and uh, 
we only get information about armies uh, being mobilised at, at Apamea and all, all uh, uh, and occasionally uh, Daphne and uh, Antioch. Uh, but uh, that I wonder if that's a reflection of the of the the state of the evidence, or there were other mobilisation centres. You know, for example, you know earlier in, on on in the empire, if the if the the king thought that a campaign eastwards was uh, was necessary did he or did he order the troops to mobilize in for example media um and it, it's it's a, a question that uh, is unanswerable because of the of the, the sparse nature of the evidence yeah? okay i think i think that's that's i'll quit there yeah uh well so with the Babylonian uh, local evidence, we have the idea of, of conscripting forces that that concentrate, I think, probably at Seleucia, uh, based on where the headquarters of the, the general of, of, of Babylonia uh, was located. And so at least at that local level, there's that idea of marshalling there. Uh, we have some other depictions of, you know, if you can move your mint to support your army, you can probably move to some degree where you concentrate your forces, marshal them, uh, and form them into these units. Uh, I mean, that would, that would, that would make sense. Uh, but yeah, like you said, most of the evidence points toward the Seleucus and particularly, uh, toward, toward Apamea. Although, uh, Pausanias uh, says that the marshalling point for the army heading west uh, to fight at uh, at Chiropedion is is in Babylon. Uh, now that's very early, and some of the practices that develop later may not have emerged yet, uh, but that gives us a a potential counterexample. Um, well, the, it's, it's also an interesting question whether they were, uh, you know, uh, uh, mobilization for fun, for one region, yeah, and you know a full uh, a full concentration of forces at uh, at uh, you know, at, at, uh, for example, at Apamea, uh, because there is a, a reference to this, uh, you know, uh, these uh, in uh, in Maccabees to the uh, when. Uh, I forgot why the king is not found, but when he is giving encouragement to his uh, his Jewish forces, to to he says that uh, that uh, um, uh, take heart for you know we fought together with eight thousand uh, 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 Macedonians in Babylon, right? Yeah? Which 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 uh, uh, Ben has dated to this the War of the Brothers, is not. And, uh, and 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 Kirastiche is a, is, an, is another example of, of you know um, um, a, a region a recruitment region that holds um, that it's, it's possible to interpret the evidence that they that they uh, are a cohesive group yeah and we can compare that with the Antigonid army um, you know almost it, it's almost. Uh, it's almost uh, universally uh, mobilizes in one center, a, a muster center. Yeah, but there is there is um, there is a, a passage in Livy that uh, that it uh, uh, that the king mobilized the forces from some region. I forgot what it is uh, uh, prior to to uh, to uh, descending on on on. Uh, on 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 the the, the some part of Greece, I'm not the references, but it is possible that uh, that that uh, sort of um, uh, uh, there was there was some some stage before uh, before the 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 the, the muster centre, you know, which is designated that there was one for the empire and a regional muster centre. I'll, I'll shut up now. Okay, I think uh, we have reached a good end point uh, uh, to this last lecture in our winter spring series. 
Um, thank you very much again, Paul, for your excellent paper and Phil for your very helpful feedback. I'm sure the discussion will be going on. Uh, and it's not just, just saying that out of courtesy, but uh, as most of you know, Ben and I are in the well, advanced stages of editing Seleucid Perspectives too. Many of you are uh, very much involved and uh, we are hopeful to um, finish our introduction and epilogue uh, within the next couple of weeks and also uh, share final feedback and or, or ask final questions, uh, exchange the proofs and so on. So we are still hopeful that the book will be published by the end of this year. Um, and uh, otherwise we will be going, or the, the series will be going into uh, our summer break uh, for the months of July and August before we resume with a new program in September, which will then be communicated. If any one of you uh, would like to present for the first time, present again, please be in touch. Um, and otherwise, I wish you a great summer. Um, and uh, Ben, would you like to add some words? No, I just want to say Nicholas was trying to get a question in there. And and, and no? I mean, I just have some small notes on the Babylonian material, which I think could be useful since I am uh, more familiar with that stuff. But I mean, if you want to finish recording, I can talk about it afterwards. So okay, whatever is easier. Okay. And in, 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 in that case, we'll, we'll stop the recording, but then we'll go on. Okay. Thank you to everybody.